Now, uh, if, uh, what about Jesus on whom be peace, saying that one will come after him? Uh, do we have any evidence that that could have been the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace? Now, uh, the influence from the uh, Pauline teachings uh, were such that uh, it was thought that God was sending prophets over time and finally God sent his son, Jesus, and therefore no more other prophets seemed to be necessary. The whole drama of uh, salvation has played out in history. It has come to an end. But once we realize that Jesus was a prophet, then we realize that there is no end to the, to the uh, series of prophets. Muslims believe that Muhammad on whom be peace is the final prophet by explicit declaration in the Muslim sources. So Muslims are saying we, don't, we didn't invent the idea that Muhammad is uh, the last prophet. That's what our sources say. Now the Christian Bible, if we take it that Jesus is the son of God and it looks like there's no need for prophets. But once we realize that he was a prophet of God, then uh, who was the last prophet? Where does it say he was the last prophet? There isn't anything in the Bible indicating that. On the contrary, there are things indicating that Jesus uh, expected other prophets to come after him and he's teaching Christians how to differentiate between the true prophet and the false prophet. Now, in John chapter 14, 15 and 16, there are sayings of Jesus which, in which he predicts the coming of the paraclete. In John chapter 14, verse 26, it says clearly the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. So Christians cite that and say, Muslims, you don't know what, it's talking, what you're talking about. Jesus clearly spoke about the Holy Spirit. It's not your prophet Muhammad. Okay, but let's uh, look at Christian history and how this has actually been discussed by Christian scholars. Hans Windisch, for example, in his book on the topic, says that what Jesus originally predicted was a human being, another human being, a prophet like Jesus. How then did it come to be the Holy Spirit in, in John chapter 14, verse 26? In fact, C.K. Barrett, uh, in his commentary on John's Gospel, shows that some early manuscripts did not have a holy in this place, and it just simply said spirit. So if we're talking about the spirit of truth, that's possible, uh, possibly a, a depiction of a human being who is so much the embodiment of truth that is referred to as the spirit of truth. Other indications show that, in fact, uh, what Jesus was speaking about was not the Holy Spirit to come. The Holy Spirit was, always, uh, uh, was al already always there. Uh, but uh, he, Jesus was talking about someone who was not there yet and who would come later on. It is true that some of the sayings are stylized to make it mean that it is the Holy Spirit, like the, he is going to be in you and so on. But that means that the saying of Jesus has been transmitted over the decades until it came uh, to be represented in John's Gospel in five different versions within these three chapters. And when we comb these versions back to reconstruct what was the original, scholars like Hans, Hans Windisch and others are saying that the original was such that Jesus was speaking about another human being to come after him until in some of the versions it now looks like he was talking about the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, it is even more clear that Jesus was talking about uh, a, a human being to come after him, another prophet, especially the last of the two sayings in John chapter 16. So Muslims in identifying the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the paraclete are not doing so because the Quran requires them to do so, uh, but they're doing so because it is very clear Clear. The Quran says that Jesus spoke about one to come after him who will be Ahmed and uh, Muslims are saying it looks like this is one place where Christians need to pay attention because Jesus must have said it in a more clear way uh, but some surviving element of what Jesus spoke about seems to be here and that indicates the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace. Now Shabir has argued that Muhammad is mentioned in uh, in the, the book of John chapter 14 and I would just like to thank Shabir for really uh, helping me in all these debates by proving that Jesus is God. Why do I say that? Well, in the same passage, in the very same passage of, of Jesus' presentation here, he says in chapter 16, verse 7, same, same speech by Jesus, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. So here's Jesus saying that he's the one who sends the helper or the comforter. Now, in Christian theology, that would be the spirit that he's sending because that's what the text says. But if Shabir wants to say that this is referring to Muhammad, then notice Jesus goes away and Jesus is the one who sends Muhammad. Now, according to Islam, according to Islam, who sent Muhammad? Allah, right? So, so Muhammad is sent by Allah. But Jesus says that the comforter is sent by him. Jesus sends the comforter. So if the comforter is sent by Jesus and Muhammad is sent by Allah, then if the comforter is Muhammad, that would make Jesus Allah. Jesus says he's the one who sends the comforter. If that's Muhammad, then Jesus is the one who sends Muhammad. And that would mean that Jesus is Muhammad's God. If Shabir wants to go that route, that's fine with me.
Uh, now, uh, John, uh, John chapter 14, where the paraclete is mentioned, I find David uh, caricaturing my statements, and then he uh, uh, rebuts the caricature. Uh, that, that's known in, in the logic as the straw man fallacy in argument, where you rebut the th not the thing that the person actually said, but some uh, caricature of it, which is easier to knock down. Notice that when I refer to John chapter 14, I did not refer to that statement as though this is the actual statement of Jesus. In fact, I went to great pains to show that as it is, this is not the actual statement of Jesus. It is true that I said nothing about the part where Jesus said he will send uh, the paraclete. Now David picks up upon that, but my whole approach has been to not take this as the absolute truth the way Jesus said it. I said that these are statements that developed over time. Uh, they were transmitted from one person to another, and uh, naturally they developed lives of their own. The one saying of Jesus became five different statements, uh, two in John 14, uh, one in John 15, and two in John 16. And we're trying to reconstruct what was the original statement. Yes, in the later statements of Jesus, we have it that Jesus is clear, claiming many lofty things for himself. But as James D.G. Dunn has shown, uh, that, that, that's what the later Gospels did, especially the Gospel according to John, uh, saying more about the status of Jesus. So whereas in the previous Gospels, Jesus was preaching something about the kingdom of God, here in the Gospel according to John, he is more preaching about himself, how great he is. So we have to make some uh, adjustment uh, for that. So no, I, I wouldn't accept the statement as it is, as the statement of Jesus, and, and then conclude as David was trying to lead uh, to say, well, that means that Jesus is, is God and so on. First, Shabir talks about Muhammad in John chapter 14, and he says that I'm caricaturing his uh, arguments. Uh, what he's really saying is that these statements developed over time, but just think about the methodology here, ladies and gentlemen. This is a book that begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, that the Word created everything in verse 3, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is uh, John chapter 1. The Word, is Je and the word become, enters creation, becomes Jesus of Nazareth. Um, he, Jesus is identified as the Son of God and as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world right there in John chapter 1. Later in the book, Jesus says that he's the one who will judge the world, that he's the one who raises the dead, that the dead will hear his voice and rise. And so these are the things you find in that we get to, to chapter 14 specifically. This is where Jesus calls himself the way and the truth and the life, says no one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus tells his followers that whatever they ask in his name, he will do it so he can answer prayers right there in John 14. And then we get to the, uh, the passage in question. I will ask the Father, notice, Father, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. So notice, Jesus is talking to his apostles here. He says to his apostles, he's going to ask the Father and the Father will give them another helper. So he's talking to the apostles. You talk, this is Muhammad here? This is Muhammad? And so he's going to be with them forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you. So the spirit abides with them, with his followers, and will be in you. So Muhammad abides with the followers of Jesus, and he's going to be, uh, he's going to be in them. Now, this is so absurd to say that this is talking about Muhammad. And, and Shabir says, well, he's not saying that all of this was actually said by Jesus. But it, again, you, you have the Father sending him, but Jesus says he's also sending him. So it's Father and Son who together send the Spirit, who if you look at the attributes of the Spirit, is divine. So you have Trinity here in the middle of a book it, that repeatedly declares the deity of Christ, and we're going to take that out and say, this is Muhammad, and anything that disagrees with that must have been corrupted over time. If that's the method, you could defend anything like that. I could say that's Shabir in this verse and defend it. Anything that says it's not Shabir must be a corruption. You could defend anything like this. And this is one of the main two arguments that Shabir gave us for, uh, for uh, Muhammad's spiritual reliability. Okay, so as for John chapter uh, 14, uh, again, I'm, I'm not taking the statements as they are in the Gospel according to John. Uh, uh, David has given a long list of things that the J Gospel according to John says that Muslims will not accept. In fact, I want to pause here and say, I ask Christians, why do they accept even these things that are said in the Gospel according to John? Yeah, I agree that there's a lot in the Gospel according to John that neither Muslims nor Christians should accept. Take, for example, John saying that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Where did John get this from? Did Jesus ever say, I am the Word of God? Did he say these words anywhere in the, in the Bible? Even in John's Gospel, Jesus doesn't say it. 
John is saying this about Jesus. So now, how does John know this? If Jesus didn't actually say it. Now, go back to the Old Testament. If the word of God was there with God from the very beginning, how come Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 starts with God being there and it's only God's spirit that is hovering over the waters of the deep? So there's God and God's spirit. Where, where is the word of God here? Uh, it, it, we know of a uh, mention of the wisdom of God in, in Proverbs, but wisdom of God is a female. Well, because, well, in any case, it's depicted as a female. And, uh, and she says, Yahweh created me. So, so where was the word of God in, in the Old Testament? John has actually invented this, and, and this is not something we should accept. James D.G. Dunn uh, says that many of these things which uh, uh, David just quoted, that John's Gospel is saying Jesus is the Lamb of God and so on, uh, that uh, we should ask, uh, what about the I am sayings in particular? If Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, if Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and all of these I am sayings, before Abraham was, I am, and so on, why are these statements lacking in the other Gospels? Why are they picked up only in the Gospel according to John? Uh, the, the, the obvious reason for this, according to James Dunn, is that these state statements developed later. They were not picked up by the earlier Gospels. They were not thought to be authentic. They later developed and came to be in the Gospel according to John. It's a later depiction of Jesus. Now this illustrates that when the Quran is calling Christians back to monotheism and saying that Jesus is, is a servant and messenger of God, it's actually calling Jesus, Christians back to the original uh, Jesus. Now back to John chapter 14 and uh, this paraclete saying. What I'm saying is that uh, we're not picking and choosing in the gospel according to John. We are being cautious about what we accept from the gospel according to John. Here we have five statements represented from Jesus. It's basically the same statement represented five ways in three chapters of John's Gospel. We want to know what was the original statement. And we have five, we have to comb them back and see, like if two essays are similar, we want to see what was the original one. Did one copy from the other or, what, or did both copy from the same, same source? When uh, traditions are transmitted like this, we want to know what is the original tradition. So this may, be, may have been closer. In John chapter 16, verse number uh, th uh, 13, it says, but when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. He will not speak of his own, but he will speak what he hears and will declare to you the things that are coming. This looks like a definition of a prophet, similar to the de de description in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 18, where Moses speaks about another prophet to come after him. He will do the same thing. In fact, uh, uh, Raymond Brown, in his two-volume commentary on John's Gospel, went at great lengths to show the difficulties that are there in these statements if you try to apply them to the Holy Spirit. For example, that he will convict the world. When did the Holy Spirit ever do that? And so... Many scholars, uh, even though Raymond Brown does not agree with this final conclusion, uh, many scholars that he has cited say that uh, this actually refers to a human being, a prophet to come after Jesus. It was not originally about the Holy Spirit, but that saying got transformed over time to make it appear that Jesus was speaking about the Holy Spirit. Raymond Brown says that when Jesus were, apparently was not coming back and the expectation that he should come back within the lifetime of the disciples failed, One minute. Uh, that is when John took the paraclete statement and made it refer to the Holy Spirit like this uh, to say that Jesus somehow is that Holy Spirit coming back. And that uh, gives you another theological problem because it means that Jesus is the Holy Spirit, whereas in classical tr Trinitarian doctrine, Jesus is not the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is not Jesus and neither is the Father. Uh, and so we have problem upon problem. The solution for all of this is to recognize that Jesus was speaking about another prophet to come after him. That prophet is the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, Shabir launched an attack on the Gospel of John. Now, who quoted the Gospel of John to defend his prophet? Th that, that, that was Shabir. Uh, our topic tonight isn't the reliability of the Gospel of John. Uh, Shabir quoted the Gospel of John, picked a verse right from the middle of it, uh, and said that this verse, where, which is identical, where Jesus says that the Comforter is coming and identifies him as the Spirit, that this is talking about Muhammad. And I pointed out what would be just the obvious absurdity. This is a book which claims over and over again that Jesus is God, that Jesus is dying on the cross for sins, and that he's going to rise from the dead. So going to the middle of a book like this and saying, uh, yeah, we're going to pick something out of this, and it's just, I mean, it boggles the mind. Using this method, you could say that verse means anything whatsoever. Shabir says, ah, well, we have five different versions. Show me, show me a version of the Gospel, John, that doesn't begin by calling Jesus the Word 
of God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, it says uh, a verse that doesn't say that the Word was God. Shabir says, well, you know, what, uh, where is he getting this from? Well, I, I, we don't know what Jesus said to John during his lifetime, but John is obviously applying uh, the various statements in the Old Testament, which talks about God creating through the Word. Uh, for instance, Psalm 33, verse 6, uh, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. So John is applying these. You can say, you can say it's wrong. You can say John doesn't know what he's doing. That has nothing, that has nothing to do with this. If you're saying that John doesn't know what he's talking about, he's making this up as he goes along, why are you quoting John 14? Why are you quoting this man who's making things up as he goes along and has no clue what he's talking about? Well, because he includes this little part that if we throw out everything, he say, everything else he says in the area and we throw out the rest of the book, we can defend Muhammad. Again, I can defend Shabir like this. I can defend Chris like this. <laughs> Shabir, now, Shabir tied this in. He quoted uh, John chapter 16, verse 13. says that this, this is, sounds like it's describing a prophet. So notice, he quoted chapter 14 and chapter 16, picked a verse out of each and said, yes, this shows that this is talking about a prophet, and then ignored all the rest of the text where this person is sent by Jesus and where he has all these kind of attributes that apply to God. And then that's the method. Uh, and again, this is, this is the main proof that he's a prophet. But Shabir, interestingly, said that this is the prophet similar to Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Uh, this will tie into the uh, satanic verses story. Because let me go ahead and read chapter 18 in its, uh, chapter 18, verse 18 in this context. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen. So this is God. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So, he gives two criteria of a false prophet right there in the passage that Shabir quoted. Shabir appealed to Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Right there in Deuteronomy 18.20, just two verses later, we have two criteria of a false prophet. If he speaks a word that God didn't tell him to speak, and if he speaks in the names of other gods. Why is this relevant? Well, according to early, our earliest Muslim sources, Muhammad delivered a revelation saying that you can pray to Allah, Alusa, and Manat, three goddesses. And he later comes back and says, that didn't actually come from God, that came from somewhere else. So, here's the point. Shabir, over these uh, past two days, has shown a lot of concern for the Old Testament and being in line with the Old Testament. I haven't talked about that too much because I reject the methodology. If the guy who rises from the dead tells me what to believe about God, I'm going with the guy who rose from the dead. But Shabir has appealed over and over again to the Old Testament, to the Torah. If we do that, Moses says, the prophet who does these two things has to die. And what this means is, if Muhammad had delivered the satanic verses, which he does, according to Muslim sources, and it's not the sort of thing Muslims would invent, if Muhammad had done that during the time of Moses, Moses would have told the people to pick up stones and stone him to death as a false prophet. Fortunately for Muhammad, he wasn't in the time of Moses. He was among pagans where he could get away with that. But if we're talking about whether Muhammad is in line with the Torah and the Torah says he would have been, he would have been killed, probably not someone we can trust to talk about Jesus. Uh, the, the paraclete saying, I did not selectively just pick the one thing I liked out of the gospel according to John. Uh, uh, my general approach to the gospel according to John is that we must comb, what was, uh, comb the gospel to find out those snippets of information which actually go back to the authentic Jesus. It looks to me like this paraclete saying is an authentic saying uh, of Jesus when it refers to a human being, another prophet to come after Jesus. And that is a painstaking uh, re uh, effort that leads to that uh, uh, result of comparing and contrasting and trying to reconstruct.